Well, welcome everybody into this um, webinar. I see some people who are uh, a little bit worried that there is uh, still silent because that's everybody's on mute. And I just unmuted myself, so I hope you... Um, you um, my name is um, Hans Tesselaar. I'm the executive director of Bayern, and it's a great honor to, uh, to welcome so many people in this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar. Um, uh, we have with us today um, uh, Guy Reckham. Guy is the, the lead architect uh, from Bayern. Uh, we have uh, Patu from, um, from IBM, who will take the IBM. Uh, ah, I see some message. It's loud and clear. That's good. Um, uh, and uh, we have uh, Victor Dossi from Microsoft, um, who at the end will um, give some explanations of um, the, um, the usability of the cloud. Uh, so um, I just start still people in, in entering the, the room. Uh, we have a an, um, an, 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 an large audience today, um, still counting, but we start just due to the fact of uh, otherwise we have a an, an timing issue at the end. Um, so let's look at the, um, the agenda for today. The agenda is, of course, the welcome. Well, it's a very warm welcome. And then uh, we will... Um, uh, uh, go behind the, the, the key concepts of the buying standard that will be done by, uh, by a Guy Reckham. Similar when uh, how we can use that standard in applying it uh, to the cloud and the cloud uh, environment. Um, then uh, we have uh, Patu uh, explaining how we can use um, the, the buying example, uh, the buying service landscape in combination with the IBM solutions. And um, as I stated, then some solution offerings uh, from uh, Victor Dossi uh, from uh, Microsoft. So let me start by um, uh, welcoming you again. This is an, an, an attempt from my side to uh, to show where everybody uh, is dialing in from. Um, it's, um, it's it's rather difficult to get all those names um, on um, on the globe, but you can see it's all around the globe. And uh, unfortunately, um, as we saw, there is no dial-in number for Brazil, uh, but we are all working on that for the next time. Um, uh, so it's uh, from um, uh, east to west and from north to south, um, and uh, it's great uh, to see uh, this uh, much of interest in buy-in, and especially, of course, in the cloud, because we all know that the cloud is not only a buzzword, it's a hot topic, um, it's, uh, it's everywhere, and we hope to give you some guidance in if and how to use uh, the, the, the buy-in landscape and to make it, an, let's say, a more secure environment to the cloud than it is, and especially there's a great need for more security and uh, confidentiality uh, in the financial service industry. Um, I just have to, um, uh, I'd like to show you the slide of um, the current uh, buy-in members. Uh, we are um, growing fast in 2014. Um, we are over um, 12 members now, new members in uh, 2014, uh, both from um, the bank side as uh, from the partner side. And you see a lot of familiar names. Um, a lot of them are also in the call, so I'd also like to welcome everybody um, from um, uh, our members who are in the call. And uh, you also see that we have uh, three academic partners that we're also very proud to have a close collaboration with those three. So if you want to have more information about the members, please visit um, the buyin.org uh, site. Um, the basis of this webinar is a white paper. Um, uh, the white paper is written by uh, um, several members and is uh, uh, edited and audited by, uh, by uh, the buyin membership. And we will make uh, the, the white paper uh, available uh, by uh, tomorrow morning uh, European time. Uh, so then you can download the, the whole paper, everything that's in um, uh, the, um, uh, the webinar today. You can also read back in the uh, available uh, and downloadable paper. Um, just want to give a little bit of difference, the explanation between a buy-in member and a buy-in non-member. The non-members have access to all our material like the, uh, the white paper I just mentioned. You have access to the, the buy-in landscape that will be shown by Guy later on. Uh, uh, we have, uh, for our non-members, we have an HTML version um, uh, um, available. Um, and um, uh, for our members, we have a UML version. And um, on the other hand, uh, the, the buy-in members have access to all material 
um, um, work in progress and so on and so forth, whilst the, um, the non-members, we can, of course, give only access to the published uh, material. Uh, I, um, um, in the meantime, I also a question. So um, just to give a little bit of feedback again on buying, we are an, an, a member-driven organization. We are a not-for-profit association. Uh, so we only have members, um, and, and the members uh, are in charge, more or less. They d decide the, the priorities and so on and so forth, appoint the board, and um, all the buying deliverables are royalty-free, as you can see in this slide. And, of course, there is a uh, buying membership, and I would like to encourage you, encourage you all to look at the buying.org site and take into consideration if it works well for your organization uh, to become a member of buying, to get access to the working groups, our meetings, and the work in progress. And on the right-hand side, you can see the, um, uh, the membership fee. It's an annual fee. It's a flat fee. There are no additional costs. Um, so this is what you pay on an annual basis, and there are no hidden or secret costs. And then you have unlimited access uh, to all your um, uh, to all our material. Um, if you become a member, we have different um, uh, uh, engagement levels. So there are members who visit our meetings, our physical meetings. We have three physical meetings on an annual basis. The next meeting uh, is um, in October in um, uh, Lagode in the south of France, in Nice, at the, um, the uh, IBM Client Center. If you're interested to, um, to join that meeting, um, as an observer, feel free to go to the bind.org site um, and uh, register. And there are no costs involved. And we are extremely welcome, uh, welcome you uh, to have, an, let's say, a an, an, an taste of what we're doing, how we are doing, what the atmosphere is, the quality of the discussions, and so on and so forth. Uh, the second um, engagement level is uh, with those members who do reviews of the material produced by others. Um, and the third engagement level is the active contribution uh, of um, the, 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 our members participating in uh, working groups. We have around 25 working groups, loans, lending, payments, and so on and so forth, but also communication, strategy. Um, and uh, you can see on the right-hand side what the additional um, contribution would be, uh, just besides membership fee. If you um, becoming a full uh, a member, participating in working groups, and then it will cost you around 15 uh, person days on an annual basis, an additional investment. Uh, but I think uh, you get a an, uh, an direct uh, return uh, on your investment. So please take a look at this one. See if it's something for you. The, the work groups meet on average every two to three weeks for an hour, an hour and a half, like we, uh, like we do today uh, with an, um, uh, an, uh, an web session and a conference call. So now I um, go to the next slide, um, and now I hand over uh, to Guy Rickham. Guy Rickham is the, um, the, the lead architect of Bayern, and he will guide you to the rest of the, um, of the webinar. Guy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Hans. Um, hope I'm coming through loud and clear as well. Um, <laughs> For me, you do. You. Good, great. Thanks, Hans. <laughs> okay, so uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I've got two sections to go through. I think there may be some people on the call who may be quite new to Bayern, so what I've done is I've pulled out five or ten minutes just to go through the basic concepts behind Bayern, because it is quite important that you, you understand it's a different type of model that we're using. And after that foundation, I'll, I'll dive into some of the key um, concepts that you'll find in the white paper about how we think Bayern as a standard might help you engineer cloud solutions. So quickly, on, uh, let me run then through that uh, sort of overview of Bayern. So on page 10, um, you'll see this is the schedule of releases and a couple of key points here. What we're trying to do in Bayern now is, is have material releases twice a year. You've got one just coming up in October where we hope to have a lot more service operations out for those of you who are already familiar with the standard. And what's happened in the last couple of years is we, after a period of working out how we wanted to do these designs, we've really started to accelerate having content. And the experience in this white paper is, is um, one of many where, as members are starting to use the standard, we're learning an awful lot. So um, it's been a very interesting uh, year and a half as we roll the content out, and I think the, the pace is accelerating. So what actually is in the BIND standard? Let's uh, flip to page 11. 
And uh, if you if you get one of these releases on page 11, it shows you the main thing. So it's the the service landscape itself on on the top there, which has I think it's about 280 now uh, service domains, which are if you like the discrete service center capabilities. Um, the standard goes down to the service operations that connect those uh, service domains together. There's a comprehensive set of guides called the Hyper Guide. It's actually three documents. And everything we're going through today, short of the cloud stuff, is actually documented in the, the how-to guide. So um, you can download that for free off find.org. And um, I recommend anything that's not clear, uh, struggle through the how-to guides, and you should be able to work it out. Um, there are presentations that we use internally. Um, on the bottom left here, you'll see, and we won't dig into this into too much detail, but the BIAM standard is built on top of the ISO 20022 standard. It's an extension of that. And there is a comprehensive specification of the extension um, uh, in the metamodel documentation for those of you that want to actually uh, import it into tooling for UML. Um, increasingly now, all of the BIM standards you'll find in the Magic Raw repository. And so you can see the service landscape. And then the last thing here, the business scenarios. We, we publish quite a few scenarios. These are basically examples of use. So you have a business event. Uh, and you can see the different service domains that are involved in processing that event. Uh, so business scenarios are quite a useful way of accessing the model. So pressing on, on, on page 12, what I'd like to sort of establish here is the level of detail we get down to. The, the bio model is a business architecture. So it's fairly high level. So we have the 280 service domains and then the scenarios, which model different business events. And we go down then to the semantic descriptions of the service operations between them. So it's, it's fairly high level, but we found that is actually a, a good level of definition to start organizing and partitioning your application portfolio. OK, so moving on now, let's um, uh, on page 13. I want you to, um, to get into why the buy-in model is slightly different to something that you might be familiar with. And I just want to take an example of uh, a, a different architectural view. Um, any good architectural design brings together two viewpoints, as you see at the top there with the city planning or business uh, town uh, building architecture. There are really two considerations. There's the, the physical things that make up the town and then the behavior of the people that move around that town. And that combination of those things allow me to draw a town plan. When we think of a business, it's not tangible like a city. And it's, it's much harder to work out what are the intangible ingredients, if you like, of a city um, that enables me to build the town plan. We're very good at building the processes or understanding the processes that we follow, but what we don't have is the building blocks to be able to, to create that equivalent model. And, and what the buy-in model does is define those discrete capabilities that you assemble into that town plan. So it's giving an alternate view that sort of supports the process view of things. Um, and that's an important distinction to think about when you, when you look at the buy-in service domains. These are these capability building blocks. On page 14, we see what happens if we build a town, town without a town plan. We end up with a shanty town. We build things as and when we want them. And without any governing plan, we end up with um, the shanty town mess. And moving quickly on to 15, uh, you see the equivalent uh, viewpoint when we build applications for a commercial business. And um, maybe you're lucky you're in an organization that doesn't look like that, but in my experience, the vast majority of large organizations, uh, when they look at their application portfolio, have something like you see on the right on page 15. And what we're trying to do with the buy-in model, as we flick onto page 16, is, is come up with an organization framework, if you like, the town plan of the business that shows non-overlapping capabilities. Um, and if you move towards aligning your systems to those non-overlapping partitions, we're hoping that you can progressively over time elim eliminate the complexity in your portfolio. And that's what we're showing on slide 16. So I'll through that very quickly. Um, as I said, the how-to guides give you a background to this. But let me give you an example on um, page 17 of some of the, the, the properties and reasons why we've gone down this path in, in BIOM. I've just been describing why it's capability-based as opposed to process-based. Because processes are dynamic. They're like journeys through the city. You can have many of them. Um, capabilities, like the buildings in the city, are sort of discrete and much more stable. And so it's a much uh, stronger base on which to establish um, a non-changing standard. 
Um, you'll find things in the in the how-to guide as to how we come up with right-sizing these things. There's quite a, an elaborate technique behind making these uh, service domains elemental, and, and th that's the trick that then makes these things canonical. We found with all of our members, we can model scenarios using the service domains, and everyone can agree on the discrete roles of the service domains, and that's key, obviously, to developing a, a standard for the industry. And then the last thing on, on page 17 to underscore is a service domain defines a role. It doesn't say how that role is fulfilled. It just says, I need to be able to do something without limiting you in exactly how you do it. And that, that enables us to build models that are persistent over time. You see the phrase at the bottom there. If I modeled a bank 10 years ago now or 10 years from now, if they were still in the same businesses and the same geographic scope, I should end up with the same a service domain supporting that bank. Let's look at the, the capability base thing now and flick on to page 18. Um, it, it's often difficult to, to, to grasp quickly what's the difference between a process view of things and a capability view of things as I've just described. So I'm going to use an example to give you a flavor of that. Uh, we all know the credit card billing cycle. Um, and what we've got here on 18 is a simplistic way, way of breaking that down. If I was going to build a billing system, um, and I was going to model this as a process, this is the decomposition I might get to. And I keep drilling down until I've got little process elements there, and I could program them as input process output building blocks and assemble my billing application. On page 19, you see that same process. And I know it's fairly high level. But there, here's the same process. And I, now this time, I've modeled it as a collaboration between service domains. And there on the right, you see five service domains. Each of these service domains is a service center that's responsible for doing something. It's a capability. And you can see at the top there cards that owns, if you like, the fulfillment and handles all the rules of processing. If you, if you have a credit card, it orchestrates that for you. Underlying that is the, uh, the agreement. And those are the specific terms and conditions that may apply to one particular customer. Uh, so your cycle date and the fees and rates. Cash accounting um, sits underneath that, which uh, maintains the journal log, if you like, so I can track my balances and payments under cash accounting. Correspondence handles messages to and from the customers, and payment order handles the movement of funds. And what you can see there is those five service domains, um, the little red bar, uh, balls and lines, show the service traffic between them that's involved in actually doing the billing process, if you like. And on page 20, we've drawn it a different way. And there you can see how the process view on the top, where I might have processed and automated um, an end-to-end -end sequence of tasks, now becomes a sort of set of service exchanges between service domains. So it's a slightly different model. And um, hopefully, by going through that example, you get a little bit of a flavor. As I say, the how-to guide is a good place to go to. But you do need to think slightly diff differently about modeling behavior when you talk about service domains and service centers and capabilities, whatever you want to call them, as opposed to the more conventional end-to-end -end process automation view of things. A couple of other points just to make before we move on to the actual the meat of this talk when we get into the cloud. Um, there are some disciplines behind how we at Vine have uh, defined a service domain. And on 21, you just see the, the main characteristics of that. If you get into the standard, you'll see um, things called functional patterns. You'll see states. You'll see um, things that are operated on assets or, or, or resources, if you like. And every service domain combines some resource or object that it owns or has, has control over and some kind of action it performs on it, like building up a history or developing a plan. And every service domain combines an asset with an action and the service domain is responsible for fulfilling that uh, action on that asset from start to finish or for its full life cycle. And that's a sort of generic pattern for all the service domains. And over the years, we've found that that is actually a repeatable uh, design process we can use to right size and correctly scope our service domains. And I'm skipping over this very quickly. The theory is actually in, in the house of guys, but um, perhaps just good to have a quick flow of that. And then just wrapping up. In terms of the historical view on page 22, so there you see the bind service landscape. A very nice way to think of it is as a periodic table of elements. If I wanted to assemble 
anything in the world. I can build it from a finite number of elements. And the bank service landscape really says what are the logical capabilities or building blocks of a bank or any financial institution. And it tries to isolate all the discrete elements, if you like, that I would assemble in different combinations and patterns to make up my bank. And uh, without going into it, you'll see the service domain properties on the left-hand side. Again, um, there's lots of design thinking and, and I, uh, aspects around or features of a service domain. For the rest of this call, the most important thing is that you understand it's a discrete operational capability, um, and any bank can be modeled by uh, selecting the right combination of these uh, capabilities and assembling in a way that they work together to execute the bank's business. And then just one, one last slide. I forgot I had this one in here. Um, when we look at the way members are using the standard at the moment, um, and when we look at the cloud, it's actually a combination of two. When we started out, we thought people were going to really be using the, the, the service domains and the service operations, if you like, as a high-level requirement specification to start, uh, as I started the presentation, tidying up the overlapping mess in the application portfolio and improve the interoperability. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see because these service domains, as I also mentioned, define things that don't change over time, you can use them to draw a map of your business that is very stable and it becomes a planning framework. And so the combination of using the BIAN standard to develop a business blueprint on one side and then the elements of that blueprint being the good partitions for a service-based implementation, the combination is quite compelling. Um, and it's a good, good to have those two uses in mind when we look at um, what, how, how that, that rolls into the way we might do the cloud. Okay, so that, that completes going over the high-level view of BIAN. Let's move on to the beat of the discussion and what you'll find in the white paper, how this standard applies in the context of the cloud. And on page 25, I've put a sort of very simple litany of, of, of how banks have gone through the competitive uh, wave, if you like, introduced by technology. And we all know the technology wave has been um, flying for quite some time. Uh, dramatic changes with the web, and now the cloud, um, all sorts of technology has driven things. Initially, banks could um, exploit that technology and carry, carry on doing the products and services that, that they, they were traditionally offering. Um, as time went by, they had to become more and more innovative, uh, packaging and delivering those products faster, better, cheaper. But what we're seeing now with some of our members, and obviously beyond buying, is that banks are looking at a different competitive landscape. They're, they're realizing that just building faster, better products and services will not necessarily enable them to defend and compete in the market. They need to start looking into, the, into their uh, customers and recognize what they as a bank might be able to integrate into the way that their customers deliver their products and services, almost in, in, a, in, in an alliance partnership, getting into their supply chain something we saw in the auto industry where they became really a finance business. Well, banks can offer all sorts of financial services. Um, what other industries can integrate banks um, in different ways to, to support them? And this is, a, if you like, a new battlefield for the, the banks to, to compete on. And the cloud is something that enables them, as much as anything, to move into that space. So on page 26, let's, def let's just define the cloud. Um, it's a term I'm sure we all heard banded around. It's, it's actually broadened in its meanings. Um, we use a pretty simple um, set of definitions. Obviously, we stole these. Um, uh, looking there crudely at the sort of stack on the left-hand side, at the top, there's software as a service, which is where um, the cloud offers you know, operational capabilities for you. I'd like you to design a product for me. I'd like you to clean my car. Um, software as a service. Um, is where you would go to the cloud to to get some business capability delivered to you. Below that, platform as a service, I'll put this very simply, but it's about, about the development environments, the, the, the creating and distribution of application software. And then at the bottom, where perhaps most of the traffic it is at the moment, is the infrastructure as a service, where you're just really going to the cloud to get direct access to the platforms. The key thing to note in this is um, what we're talking about in the buy-in model 
is really the structuring and definition and organizing of things at the software as a service level, where you as a business go to another business and ask them to do something for you. Now, clearly underlying that exchange of services, there's all sorts of application requirements and all sorts of technical platform requirements. Uh, what we're saying is those don't go away. You still need to do those. Those need to be solved. But um, to a great extent, there are solutions for uh, PAS and IAS uh, implementations. What we're looking at with the, the buy model is putting a superstructure, like a conceptual framework for defining and partitioning the business services that sit on top of that uh, platform and in infrastructure. So on page 27, I want to just sort of, sort of float one observation uh, about the nature of service exchanges. Um, on the left, you'll see the more conventional if I'm inside a business and we're all sharing a platform infrastructure. When we look at interfaces between different parts of the business, we often find ourselves driving those exchanges down machine to machine or database level. Um, and the, the definition, if you like, uh, of the exchange is, is, is very fine-grained. In the cloud, there's the option to, you can't do that, obviously, but in the cloud, you can actually move up and, and exchange um, information and invoke services, really just agreeing semantic terms. So I could be in, in marketing, if you like, and I could identify the hands as a prospect. Um, I don't need to plug into my sales systems at the data level to be able to tell them to give Hans a call. Um, and you'll find that there are a lot of service exchanges where the agreements and exchanges of information merely needs to be at the semantic level of agreement. It doesn't require a full data um, mapping. Okay, so... Moving on to page 28, let's look at how things have developed, if you like, uh, and how people initially started using the, 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 the buy-in landscape. But the first thing was to say, um, how can I better structure my systems? And as I described earlier, the buy-in landscape is a great way to break your business into discrete, generic building blocks that you can service enable. And I've simplified that with this little nine-box diagram at the bottom on page 28. And, and really the motivation to do this was to uh, reduce the overlaps and complexity and, and ease integration, if you like. And on the right, you can see as banks move towards a generic model, then they can start to insource and outsource things from it, as you've seen in the trading, private banking, uh, product alliances. There's a lot of um, service exchange. Um, and, and having a standard packaging of that is a, is a great way to do it. And indeed, one of the tests we have of good service domain is that you could imagine someone doing it for you. You've got a well-defined service domain with its service operation boundaries. I should be able to throw it over the fence and have someone else do it for me and still integrate it into my own application. So initially, the buy model helped us just looking at, looking at, if you like, componentizing or modularizing business. On page 29, we see another view. Here we see a solution provider looking across the buy-in landscape and saying, I don't want to just insource and outsource because I have excess capacity. I may want to build a solution that lots of people can have, a slightly different business case. Um, a good example of this is credit agencies, where they said everyone needs to do credit uh, analysis and scoring. Why don't I do this for the whole industry? Um, and if they package that up as a cloud service, you can see that they are solution A on the right-hand side, offering their service to many, many banks. If we actually then put more and more of the buy-in model into the cloud, we can start seeing, obviously, the bank insourcing out. So it can happen, as you see on slide 30. And then on slide 31, nothing to stop the solution providers or anyone else uh, plugging and playing services through the cloud. And the key thing to note here is that we're not talking about um, providing infrastructure. We're providing business services or operational capabilities um, through the cloud. So having someone design my product or um, relation, manage, relation manage this uh, this customer or do this market analysis for me, whatever it may be, any meaningful business capability should be packageable and exchangeable through the cloud. 
And that raises a couple of practical questions, obviously. Um, how do we do this? And to take a step back, we've been um, watching a, a different area, not driven by the cloud, but driven by um, the, the use of ESBs to rack host systems. So we've got a little bit of experience of this um, with our members over the last 12 months, and that's summarized on page 32. So what people were doing here was they were using the bind service landscape and saying, well, we've got a discrete set of service domains, each with a unique non-overlapping capability with its associated service uh, capabilities, offered and consumed services. If I take those as a collection, they give me a, a canonical, if you like, non-overlapping set of service definitions. And I could configure my ESP to offer those services. And then in the top right-hand corner you see on page 32, I could start to assemble applications from those uh, service-based capabilities. Obviously, it's not as easy as that, but as a sort of conceptual design, if I can package my host systems behind well-partitioned, non-overlapping services, then application assembly becomes an easier thing. Now, there's a lot to do behind the scenes to make this work, and I don't want to belittle that. Uh, we see on page 33, you know, there's a big challenge of wrapping your host systems behind that ESP to make it all work, and, and we don't want to trivialize that, but a couple of members have, uh, have moved down this path. It's not something that will happen overnight, but um, you, incrementally you can start to offer services aligned to the buying service domains and service operations and, and deal increasingly with the, the complexity and overlaps in the host systems with various techniques you see listed on the top of page 33. Now that's all well and good if I'm connecting things inside my bank. Um, and I trust everybody, but no one expects a bank to publish its ESB to the outside world because it would have no control over what people would do. So the last thing I want to talk about is how we believe the service domain uh, capabilities allow us to, to take those host services, if you like, but package them in such a way that we could conceivably um, feed them outside. And just as the, the banks with the vision of using the ESB to assemble applications internally, if I could find a way to, to move those ESB services to the cloud, maybe I could start to assemble applications, as we were talking about earlier on, with my, my alliance partners and customers in the outside world. And on page 34, you see a concept that we, we, we're playing with with the, the, the buy-in landscape about using a service domain to define a container, and through the role of that service domain, it constrains what service access I do and don't have. Um, so there, there you see the service obligations as a provider and consumer, summarized on page 34. But let's stick to page 35 with an example. Um, imagine the service domain that we're going to assemble into our external system was relationship management, for example. And here the container would say, if you build your relationship management software within our container, you would have service-enabled access to the bank in proportion to the role of a relationship manager. The customers, the data, the actions, and the input we'd accept back from you is all packaged and constrained by the business role, relationship management, that defines the service domain. And what we're anticipating is in time as people wrap their host systems um, and as they want to get into this plug-and-play world in the cloud, that either by specification or maybe even actual software containers um, that wrap and govern their service access around the roles of service domains might be a very good high-level conceptual design to enable us to uh, define and deliver uh, cloud-based service access to the bank's capabilities. Uh, that was a, a lot to go through quickly. Um, it's all, as I say, laid out in the paper, um, but hopefully you've got a flavor of that. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over now to Patu, who's going to uh, show how we take the designs down to actual cloud implementation with the, with the case study. Thanks. Thanks, Guy. Um, yeah, um, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Patu Patnaik. I lead... Uh, Banking industry solutions um, in the IBM software group. Um, 
So in, in, in this part of the presentation, I want to describe how the Bayan service domains and their semantic services are interpreted for implementation in, in, in cloud. And I want to use uh, account opening as an example. And um, so to do this exercise, we, we basically leveraged uh, I, uh, IBM Bluemix cloud uh, development platform. Um, so Bluemix is an implementation of IBM's, uh, uh, you know, open cloud architecture, leveraging the cloud foundry. And it en enables uh, developers to rapidly uh, build, deploy, and, and manage their uh, cloud applications while, you know, tapping into a growing um, ecosystem of, uh, um, you know, available services, runtime frameworks, and, and the standards like that. Right? So let's, on, on, chart, on page seven, 37 here, so um, we have seen um, that the Bayan service landscape and the Bayan business scenarios define a, a business architecture, a functional decomposition, and that can be mapped to an underlying systems architecture for, for implementation. So um, in practice, what happens is there are times when a Bayan service domain can be supported by several fine grain uh, IT components, or sometimes um, a larger IT system may be supported, uh, may support uh, several service domains as well. So the implementation level details of the service domains will typically um, by far um, more um, complex um, compared to the, I mean, compared to the high level semantics uh, service definition. Um, but their collective scope and, and purpose will always remain the same. So in, in, in this example, we leveraged, um, you know, IBM industry models, also known as IFW models, uh, in terms of fine grain business process models, the service models and message and data models to fill these uh, implementation details. Um, so the, these IBM banking services, we, we call them, are developed, uh, deployed, and composed um, uh, to form larger IT systems on the I, IBM Bluemix Cloud platform here. So let, let's go to next chart, uh, chart 38 here. So for the purpose of the proof point, um, we took universal account opening business scenarios as I was explaining. So the diagram here um, shows the service domains involved in, in an offer process. So um, the service components that are mapped to these service domains may be um, in sourced in a, in a private cloud or on on-premises infrastructure, or it can outsourced on a, on a public cloud. So in, in, the, in the example here, um, we're assuming that, uh, you know, components like uh, credit, um, customer credit rating, um, correspondence and sales product um, that are colored in orange are all outsourced, while the rest of the components like cross-channel offer management um, are, are insourced. So, so how, how, is this, how does this work? When a, when a request um, uh, is uh, made from a channel, the request is dynamically routed to the back end through this network of um, service components in the, in the middle. So the, the interacting service components here determine what is the next best action based on the state of the, um, you know, the service component and the current context in which the request is made, uh, rather than, you know, hardwiring these uh, control flows. Um, and, and this it can be implemented on the Bluemix platform. I'll talk about that a little bit more detail in, in the next uh, few chart. So let's go to the next chart. Um, so to get to this, what we did is we first, um, uh, you know, started with a buy-in business scenario to ter determine the collaboration of all the service domains and summarize the key message exchanges between those um, service domains. What it provides us is um, a set of service boundaries for each of those um, uh, service components involved in this in this particular business scenario. Right. Um, so let's go to next chart, chart 40. I wanted to talk about how these um, service components are re realized. So we, we then, um, you know, developed detailed design for each of these components. Right. Uh, the, 
the, the detailed design will include uh, the API definitions uh, for what the service components are exposing and consuming, uh, the design of the local storage of each component, and, and the business logic that essentially drives the whole component behavior. So if you take an example, um, like uh, offer management component, so the, the control object of um, an offer management component is basically the offer. The, the offer is, is what the bank is making to a customer to sell one or more of its products. Right? So how uh, the, the, the offer object is further refined. I mean, we leveraged IFW business mod, uh, object models to detail out the data model of this control object offer. And then we, uh, we used IFW um, you know, interface definition models to di identify those fine-grained business services and, and the message model uh, that is needed to, to do the exchange, uh, message exchange between the service components. We also leveraged the, the fine-grained business processes captured in IFW and, and, um, and also the service orchestrations to identify the behavior model of these, each of these service components. So at the end, what you see is in this diagram, the universal account opening process is nothing but a collaboration of multiple service components that are um, exposing these um, pro uh, services that are provided uh, as well as um, you know, the, the um, services that they expose, I mean, that, that, that they consume. And it, this can be implemented in, in different patterns. So if you go to the next chart, um, then what we did is we took this service um, component, each of those components, and we exposed them as REST APIs, I mean, using the JSON as a way to exchange messages. And we did that because we are assuming that it is going to be, I mean, for the front office uh, applications, essentially, right? So basically this, this shows um, a set of those REST APIs of uh, offer management service component that I, I'm, I was talking about. If, if you go to the next uh, chart, um, what I wanted to talk about is, well, we captured the data model, message model, the interfaces, and all that. So now we need to capture the behavior. We talked about process models and service models to capture that. But in, in, the, in the example that I'm showing here, we took um, a, a finite state machine approach, right, where we are capturing various uh, states of the offer management service component. I mean, there are many patterns that we can use. I mean, this could be implemented as we are showing here, like an FSM, or it could be a BPMN to capture the flow of activities. Or, you know, you could, uh, very data-oriented service components, you can use like a MapReduce and a NoSQL DB for kind of doing a distributed data across, let's say, structured and unstructured data sources. And another pattern could be a real-time and our offline analytics um, leveraging both uh, predictive and deterministic models and time series analysis and things like that. So for the purposes of this example, we took a very straightforward uh, flow-oriented um, service component in the offer management uh, process. Okay. If you go to the next chart, now this is all about how we have um, you know, detailed out a service domain into an IT uh, service component. Now, this particular chart shows how that is implemented on on a uh, IBM Bluemix uh, platform. So, the, the the design here that we talked so far, it's basically implemented as a network of service components. Right? Um, we used Node.js as the container of the service component. So, you could um, use different options there, like maybe a Java container like a Liberty Profile or something like that. Or, you know, there are community-based containers like Ruby on Rails and things like that. We could, we could leverage that to host the uh, service component. Now, for the data part of it, again, we, we try to keep it as simple as possible. So we used Cloud and DB, as basically a NoSQL no DB, to capture the transient data as part of your, um, you know, account opening. Right, um, and again, there may be other options here. You can use uh, SQL DBs, MySQL DB, or uh, you know IBM SQL DB or MongoDB and things like that. Um, now, 
I talked about this dynamic behavior, uh, the next best action earlier. So we, we used a rules engine to manage and capture those uh, dynamic behavior as a set of rules that can leverage the context as well as the service um, component data, essentially to capture what is the next behavior um, that a service component needs to do. That could be sending a message um, through something like an MQ light or something like that, or invoking another service um, operation through a, um, an exposed uh, service operation from a different service domain and so on. And now, these are all the network service components running on, let's say, a public cloud, uh, cloud as well as a private cloud. Then we used some kind of a integration pattern leveraging the task and to connect to um, either on-prem or, or uh, private cloud implementations of services. Um, and and uh, I'm not, I haven't shown here, but we used the work light and, and mobile data for, for building that front-end application that is invoking this REST API. So in, in conclusion, I, I wanted to close this. Um, um, so in the conclusion, the example that I described so far is a bottom-up uh, proof point that a business design aligned to um, the buy and service domains and, and their uh, you know, associated semantic operations, service of operations, um, can be uh, you know, leveraged to implement essentially a practical, a meaningful uh, SaaS solution like an account opening. I mean, there is a lot of detail about this in the in the white uh, in the white paper, um, but given the time, I just wanted to just show the highlights of this uh, approach and how how this is implemented on on an IBM Bluemix uh, platform. Um, I know I took a lot more time than what I was expecting, but um, um, hopefully this gave some good idea, and uh, maybe Victor, you can take um, some time to talk about other um, options and solutions around here. Sure, you bet. Um, so, you know, I, I just wanted to maybe just build off of some things that uh, Guy had said earlier. I keep thinking about the analogy of the town. You know, buy-in is a lot about rationalizing, optimizing, but really be helping organizations become more nimble. And I I picture, you know, what we're trying to do with buy-in and, and focusing on the enterprise and SOA is really helping to rationalize and make that nimble. And then I picture a car perhaps just heading out of the town right through a green field that there's no roads, no impediments, no constraints. But you can imagine a little bit of driving around out there. We stand the risk of creating another uh, uh, piece of our spaghetti enterprise. And really, as we think about uh, how buy-in, and that's why I'm excited about this white paper, how is it so applicable? It's because the cloud is really becoming an extension and logical extension of our business operations. And when we start to look at how many different pieces and platforms from IIAS, you know, the infrastructure as a service, uh, Microsoft, we're one of the few, along with Amazon and a couple of others uh, that are really building these kinds of uh, uh, what we call hyperscale clouds. Uh, but they bring a tremendous amount of opportunity. Uh, we have really a, an infrastructure there. We've got Rackspace and those types of folks, even uh, SAP's HANA um, being a, a cloud-based at this point. Um, the platform, uh, same goes there. Uh, uh, and interestingly, you know, some of the workloads and some of the opportunities that we see, um, it, it's really starting to explode. So the ability to really offload things that are not core competencies or core critical to their business, that was the first stuff to go off there, but now really core to the business. Um, Temenos has a T24. Uh, they run their core banking uh, on our infrastructure in the cloud and then provide that as an infrastructure, as a software, as a service out to uh, a number of countries uh, for microfinance. You know, a few years ago, who'd have thought this, but they've actually been running that in our cloud for a number of years. Another area that's just been huge and really exploding is the ability to burst and start to do analytics out there. Uh, at the same time, and this gives processing power and the ability to start to consider and look at risk in a whole new way. And then if we start to think about how that starts to combine with, uh, 
you know, the big data platforms and pieces that our platform as well as the others have, uh, um, it starts to become really exciting. Everyone's buzzing about the Internet of Things, but no one's quite sure, well, how am I going to leverage this? So I'm really excited to see, you know, the uptake. At the top of this slide, it talks about Gartner and some of their predictions. It was interesting uh, to, to come into this call. I just uh, left a room full of bankers, and a question was asked one year ago, how many of you in your organizations heard, there will be no cloud in my organization? And most of the hands went up. And then they said a year later, how many do not have cloud operations or aren't moving towards the cloud, and not one hand went up? So really, when we talk about this becoming real, you look at the type of infrastructures that uh, uh, folks uh, um, like Microsoft, uh, but IBM, Amazon, the works, um, it's getting to be really exciting times. Another piece, and I see my colleague uh, Daniel's been typing quite a bit in there, but uh, we also have started now to offer professional services around this. And it's really an alignment to start to rationalize and make those enterprises more nimble. But like I said, just to kind of conclude on this paper, I'm really excited to see us uh, uh, considering this and considering the same buy-in paradigms and the same constructs um, that allow us to service bus of the world, if you will. Uh, so with that, you know, like I said, uh, a lot of momentum going on. I know from my company, we're, we're just as proud as can be to be participating with Bayan and to be moving uh, uh, along with our, our consortium uh, to helping moving this into the cloud. So with that, I'll hand it back, and thanks, folks. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Victor. Well, for people who maybe did not know who the last speaker was, that was Victor Dossi from Microsoft, but I think you at least, you, you knew he was from Microsoft, so well done. And it's all uh, good to see that both IBM and Microsoft are um, a long-lasting uh, Bayern member, and uh, Microsoft is uh, even one of the founding members of uh, Bayern, and uh, both Bayern and IBM um, have an, uh, an, a member in the Bayern Board of Directors, so there is an, a lot of... Um, engagement um, from um, uh, the parties involved and um, uh, besides IBM and Microsoft there are a lot a lot of others uh, contributing to the paper that you can download tomorrow so we have uh, three minutes um, uh, left uh, for some questions so if you have a question you can type it and um, if um, uh, we run out of time feel free to post your um, questions at uh, info at buyin.org um, uh, so uh, we uh, can uh, come back to you. Um, um, it's also good to know that we have recorded this uh, webinar. So if for one reason or the other you have to do uh, without uh, any uh, sound, you, you cannot hear me talking either. So who am I talking to? But if, um, then um, uh, you can uh, find in the upcoming days uh, the webinar available, the recorded version um, at the, uh, the buyin.org site. So um, uh, there are uh, some people um, typing. Uh, from your perspective, who do you think, why do you think some banks didn't opt for buy-in? Um, well, that's, an, that's a fair question. Um, um, for some of the banks, it's just an, a question of we don't know what, who buy-in is and what buy-in is doing. Uh, so uh, it uh, just has to do with brand awareness. And um, on the other side, to be quite honest, if you move to the, uh, the buy-in um, uh, service landscape, most of the banks, um, uh, and let's say 99.9% .9 of the banks, um, they have already a form of a landscape in place. Um, it's very difficult to maintain, um, uh, very difficult to keep it up to date, very difficult to keep it aligned with what, uh, let's say, the defenders are doing. And so if you decide uh, to join Bayern, and if you decide to use the material, um, then it also means that you have to do something with it. Otherwise, it's a uh, an silly exercise. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we have uh, 53 members today, uh, but the latest version of the service landscape, the 3.0 that we published in April, is downloaded around 4,000 times. So there is a lot of usage. Um, um, the buying community uh, strives for adaptation of the model. 
Um, and uh, of course, we need the members uh, to uh, to populate. We need the members uh, to contribute. Uh, but uh, we are extremely happy when people are using it. Um, uh, and uh, of course, you don't influence that. So if you want to create the future, um, you have to join. And if you want to consume the future, go to the buying.org site and um, and, uh, and use the material. And another question is, could I know which banks are using the buying standards practically? Um, well, it's uh, mostly uh, our members, and there are different maturity levels in the usage. So uh, when you look at the bank members um, uh, and, uh, and you, you contact them, if you, 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 you come to one of our meetings, you can speak with the, the architects of uh, our uh, member banks. They can explain where they stand. Uh, some are doing a lot of projects uh, with it and publish on it. Um, some others are building their roadmap uh, on the buying model. Uh, there are also some banks that say, okay, we look for our preferred supplier base into the buying member base because we want to move towards, an, let's say, an open source plug and play and type environment. So there are a lot of different ways of um, uh, the usage of the model. And on the buying.org site, you can find the webinar that we did last year uh, where in um, uh, Credit Suisse and Scotia Bank explain how they use the model. Two completely different uh, usage models. Uh, it's also a recorded webinar, so at buying.org you can uh, find uh, 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 two uh, examples of how banks are uh, using the model. Uh, we are uh, a little over the hour, so there is room for one more question. I see people dropping off, but so. Ali, Ali said wait, so Ali, I wait. Just one question, okay. Well, the, the question is, buy-in has many strengths, but are there any weaknesses uh, according to you? Uh, well, the... Yeah, it's a weakness and it's it's an it's an um, and it's a strength or I say weaknesses or development points, so to say. So how can we improve? I think it's a, it's a weakness and a strength that it's that we we don't have any staff, so we cannot produce let's say seven times twenty four hours our deliverables. All the material is produced um, by our members, uh, so it's completely member driven. And it's, we need the, the time and insights and knowledge of our members to do so. And then the whole model is um, uh, uh, consensus-based. So we are not publishing the best option ever. We publish um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, solutions that everybody agrees that it will work. So that's, that's ac acceptable for the banks and it's acceptable for the vendors. So maybe that is a weakness. But I think it's an extreme strength that we have so many people, so about uh, over 160 individuals um, uh, uh, involved in developing uh, the standard. So that is, is huge. So we get a lot of insights from all over the globe, uh, from banks and from our partner sites. And I think that makes the model extremely rich. So it also yeah, prevents us from, from moving extremely fast, but we do two um, uh, 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 releases uh, on an annual basis. So I think we, from a sanitization body, we're doing very well. So I think, uh, I don't want to call it a, a weakness. I would uh, like to call it an, um, an, a strength. So um, I think that um, uh, should be the conclusion for today. Um, I would like to thank everybody tremendously for uh, finding the time um, uh, uh, to, uh, to attend. Um, and um, uh, please uh, download the, um, the, the white paper tomorrow. You'll find all the underlying material. And um, uh, I hope to see you at one of our next meetings. The next meeting is in, in October in the south of France. Um, we will be at Cybus. So if you are at Cybus, please visit at the Cybus. Uh, we are hosted at uh, the Microsoft Boot E69. And looking forward to see you soon.